A państwa i moim gościem jest pan generał Robert Spalding, nie tylko autor książki Niewidzialna wojna, książki, która pojawiła się jakiś czas temu w Stanach Zjednoczonych, a pojawia się z początkiem grudnia w Polsce, ale również doradca prezydenta Donalda Trumpa, człowiek, który przygotowywał strategię obecnego prezydenta Stanów Zjednoczonych w kwestiach związanych z Chinami. General Brigadier, welcome to Poland, welcome to TVP. Thank you, great to be here. General, uh, you, in your interviews, in your book, in your public statements, very often you start with a strange question re regarding some medical machine, which is ECMO machine. Why ECMO machine is relevant when we talk about the Chinese totalitarian regime? Yes, an ECMO machine is a machine designed to keep a body alive while uh, to keep organs alive. And so it uh, oxygenates the blood in order to keep uh, to survive uh, organs. And what the why this is important is because in China with prisoners of conscience there is forced organ harvesting. And this has been um, uh, essentially investigated by a tribunal in the UK by Sir Jeffrey Nice, who was the QC that uh, looked at the, the war crimes of Slobodan Milosevic. And essentially they have come to the conclusion that this uh, organ harvesting is actually happening in China to the tune of several thousand people each year. So these are people that are Christians, Muslims, Falun Gong, that essentially go to jail for uh, prisoners of conscience as religious dissidents, essentially. Their blood type, their organs are ultrasound, and they're put on a match list. And if somebody while comes in- While they are alive. While still. they're alive. So if, they, if somebody wants a heart or lungs or a liver, then they are brought in, they are hooked up to an ECMO machine, and while they're still alive, their heart, their lungs, their liver are pulled out of their bodies and put into somebody else that, that is paying money. And so the only reason, quite frankly, that the UK tribunal decided to say that genocide is not occurring in, in China is because it is for profit. It sounds, it sounds just incredible in terms of those things that are going on right now, right now in the country that is doing business with the whole Western civilization. It is horrible. And in fact, you know, we thought, uh, the world thought that concentration camps would never come back, they're back. Uh, we thought that the horrors that existed in Dachau and other uh, concentration camps uh, during the time of Nazi Germany would never come back, it's back. If you think about the worst things that the Nazis were uh, capable of, this is organ harvesting. Crematoria are back. They're back. In China. In China. And the world knows it. We got satellites. We can picture every inch you of... You can see the concentration camps by satellite. The crematoria are next to the concentration camps. This is, uh, this is there for the world to see if they wish to take a look. Three million people over there. 1.4 billion people in China, but uh, right now uh, somewhere between 1 million and 3 million are in concentration camps in Xinjiang. General, I ask this question because in your book you are picturing a conflict. Uh, the conflict which is going on right now. Your, the title of the book in English is How China Took Over While America's elite, elite Was Asleep. Did China took over? China is taking over and in not just in the United States, in democracies around the world. In fact, they use economics, finance, and information to slowly coerce the elites of uh, democratic nations to do what they want. They have done it in the United States with the National Basketball Association, essentially telling the NBA to fire a general manager who tweeted in support of the dissidents and or the uh, freedom fighters in Hong Kong. They forced, uh, as I write in my book, uh, the Marriott Corporation to fire a mid-level employee working in Omaha, Nebraska for uh, Marriott, uh, Roy Jones, because he liked to tweet about Tibet. So the Chinese Communist Party called up Marriott and said, get rid of him and apologize, and they did. He liked a tweet living in the United States. He liked a tweet about the free Tibet, and he was fired from American corporation living in America. Right. So free so speech what doesn't exist when you have a relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. That is, that is the facts. How come 
that the Chinese Communist Party is so powerful that it can fire uh, employee of American corporation or it can cause a worldwide outrage after a general manager of Houston Rockets tweets about free Hong Kong. What they realize, what the Chinese Communi Par Communist Party realize is that economics and finance, really globalization and the internet provides them a unique capability to go into societies, to democratic societies, and enforce their own, their own interests. In fact, two PLA colonels wrote about this in 1999. They wrote a paper called Unrestricted Warfare, where they talked about using all elements of democratic societies against them to undermine the democratic principles uh, and the freedoms uh, of the people in those countries. General, in your book, you uh, claim that uh, actually this is kind of a war, of a war against the United States, but also a war against the Western civilization. You claim also that the Chinese uh, goal is to rule the world, rule the countries uh, around the world, not only in China. We are being told that China is similar to democracy, it's just a specific uh, Chinese version of democracy. Yes, and, and, and if you uh, watch TV in America, you'll hear um, elites like Michael Bloomberg say that Xi Jinping's not a dictator. Uh, in fact, my uh, son's teacher, who's in co he's a senior in college in New York, told him that uh, China is a democracy. If you know anything about the Chinese Communist Party, then you know that the Chinese Communist Party is no different than uh, the Stalin regime. It's no different than the Nazi regime. It is essentially a totalitarian and probably the most sophisticated technologically and most um, actually the richest uh, totalitarian regime ever to, uh, to exist in the world. Richest? Uh also thanks to the Western uh, business idea of doing business with China, uh, profiting from the low labor costs that are in China. Uh, now it looks like it turns upside down and we are on the losing end of this uh, business model. Well, in fact, uh, in the United States, uh, when China entered the WTO from 2001 to 2017, America lost over 70,000 factories, 3.4 million manufacturing jobs. When you add up all the support jobs for that, it was over 13 million jobs in America. So Americans are hurting. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their health care that went along with it. They've lost their retirement benefits. But more importantly, what they got in return were substandard products that either poisoned or killed them or burned them. And fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very poisonous uh, uh, opioid that has killed tens of thousands of Americans every single year. And so not only is it destroying our society in terms of the economic and societal uh, damage that's happening, it's also, as I've already stated, the, through these relationships with U.S. corporations, with, US, with Wall Street banks, with law firms, with uh, public relations firms, with consulting firms, with think tanks, with politicians, with academia, our universities, you have all of these relationships with China where China pays the elites money to look the other way while essentially we uh, sell our freedoms. General, uh, maybe it is important that you say to our viewers uh, what is your knowledge, what is your background in terms of China? You speak Chinese, you spend uh, uh, lots of time, uh, and what is the idea of the strategy that you are working on uh, in the National Security Council? So uh, I lived in China from 2002 to 2004, studied at a university in Shanghai, Tongji, Tongji University. Uh, I traveled the country. I learned uh, about the people, the culture, the history. And tr uh, quite frankly, I've spent a wonderful time there. It wasn't until later when I became uh, the chief strategist for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the Pentagon on China. I became the senior defense official and defense attache in Beijing and then ultimately the strategist, the head strategist at the White House that I came to understand the Chinese Communist Party. And essentially what we created in the strategy and the strategy that the United States is executing currently is to reconnect free trade principles with democratic principles. To say that America actually has to do business with like-minded countries that believe in uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, but also free trade. 
None of these things, by the way, the Chinese Communist Party uh, believes in. We have to protect our countries, not just the, in the United States, but uh, in other democracies like Poland. And more importantly, and this is probably the most important, and one of the reasons that I wrote the book, we need to invest in our people. We need to invest in infrastructure, in industrial-based manufacturing, in STEM education, and research and development. All the things during the Cold War that the United States was investing in to the benefit of the free world. These things are things that we have stopped investing in since the end of the Cold War. And if you notice, since China's entry in the WTO, for the last 20 years, Europe has been stagnant in economic growth, America has been stagnant in ep economic growth, and so is Asia. And why is that? It is because China is predatory and parasitic. It takes from free countries in order to provide for the Chinese people so that the Chinese Communist Party can maintain legitimacy and continue to rule. So, by the way, the Chinese leadership, the Communist Party leadership, can skim money off the top and take it from the people and make themselves wealthy. General, is the Donald Trump's uh, tariffs against China, the trade war against China, implementation of the strategy that uh, you are talking about. It's absolutely the implementation of the strategy and the next thing that I expect is to cut off China from U.S. capital markets, Western capital markets. Uh, currently their companies aren't required to um, uh, essentially comply with audit or transparency standards like U.S. companies or like European companies. And in fact, we let them have billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of American retirement funds in spite of the fact that they don't comply with our rules. This money is used then to uh, provide for uh, the Belt and Road Initiative made in China 2025, Chinese weapons, all of the things that are quite frankly the Chinese Communist Party are using to both suppress freedoms abroad and grow China's power. General, the Belt and Road Initiative is also very often portrayed in the mainstream media, uh, also in Europe, also uh, in Poland, as a purely uh, economic project. We see the maps of uh, China uh, along with the Russia, with the whole Euro-Asia as a one uh, common uh, sphere of trade. It seems very dangerous for a country like Poland, country that was ruled by the communists for more than 70 years and didn't have its own country for much more than 200 years. Well, I exactly, because what happens is in these uh, projects like ports, like railway, what the Chinese seek to do is both corrupt the officials that are responsible for accepting these um, kinds of infrastructure projects, but also they like to use that to create a market for Chinese products and also to essentially create the kind of ecosystem, uh, the, the ability to control the population through not just trade, but also uh, using the digital Silk Road, the ability to have fiber optics cables that are connect to 5G networks to control the data of free societies, also to control the electronic commerce and the social media. Uh, of, elect, of, of democratic societies. General, it seems to us that f there is not a big difference between 4G that we have in our mobile, fo mobile phones and 5G. Uh, it looks like we are going to have only a bit faster internet in our pocket. You claim that it's a total uh, misunderstanding, that 5G is a structural switch and it's also could be a danger uh, if the technology is possessed by the foreign and uh, evil country. In 2007 when the iPhone came out, uh, I remember Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, asked Steve Jobs, what are you going to do with this? What Steve Jobs had in mind was to transform the world economy. So uh, from 2007 to 2018, using the smartphone and using the 4G network, Essentially, we went from the top five companies in the United States, AT&T, General Electric, Microsoft, ExxonMobil, and Shell, to Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. These companies are driven by data and algorithms, artificial intelligence. What the 5G world is really taking away from that world, the world of the smartphone, which is, if you look at the two leading platforms for that world are Android and iOS, Google and Apple both encrypted platforms for your data. What 
Huawei seeks to do is essentially be the platform for 5G because in 5G, those smartphones go away. In fact, you walk outside your front door and you say, I want an Uber. A camera picks up your face, reads your lips, understands who you are, facial recognition, artificial intelligence. A car shows up, picks you up, take you where, takes you where you want to go and drops you off. And All, charges your and account. And charges your account because they know who you are. All of this data, by the way, is controlled by the platform. Again, it's no longer the smartphone. It is the network itself. So who builds the network controls your data. The companies, so remember I said we went from to the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google in 10 years. By 2025, what China wants is Baidu, Alibaba, 10 cents to be the dominant companies, the data companies, artificial intelligence in the world, not only to earn a profit like the Facebook uh, companies do, but also to be able to influence, to control. They want to essentially export the capability to use the same social credit score that they have deployed within China that, that scores you based on your behavior as a citizen. Do you smoke? Do you drink? Who are your friends? Do you jaywalk? Do you complain about the country? What kind of citizen are you? All of this goes into a score. And if you don't uh, score high, you don't get on public transportation. You can't buy a home. You, your kid can't get into a college. You don't get a promotion. All of these things are meant to control individual behavior. And because of technology, because of data, because of open data and artificial intelligence and big data analysis, you have the ability to very finely control individual behavior now using technology. General, if a country, if a state like or party like a Communist Party of China controls this kind of worldwide data infrastructure, it controls the population of every country that is under the, I would say, surveillance of this kind of 5G platform if it's maintained or controlled by the China. Is it the way China wants to control the world and the current or future uh, population? So there's actually a recent report that just was released by the Australian Strategic Policy uh, Institute. It's called Engineering Global Consensus. This report talks about a company from China called Global Tone Communications, GTCom. This company is a big data and artificial intelligence company that uh, puts its products into Huawei gear, into other, uh, also into cloud-based uh, translation services. So they provide translation services in 65 languages. This company is uh, jointly owned by the Minister of Finance in China and the Chinese Communist Party. It sends its three, point, or three to four petabytes of data each year to the propaganda arm of China and the intelligence arm of China. So not only is it providing a profit in terms of translation services uh, for the Chinese economy, it's also providing for the propaganda and intelligence arms. This, by the way, in the report, is, was all on their website for the company. General, my final question or actually not only the question but the issue itself uh, there's a political military fiction novel by P.W. Singer and August Cole The Ghost Fleet the United States in this novel almost loses a war against China combined with Russia because of the technological uh, technological way that China controls F-35 uh, bombers most sophisticated sophisticated weapon system that is uh, available in the world right now. Is it only the author's uh, idea or is it a possible reality in the future? I think it's a possible reality, but in, but in truth, the China doesn't seek to uh, have a war in the traditional sense. They don't seek to use military forces. What they seek to do is through our daily actions, slowly, stealthily, quietly, get us to sell our own freedoms in order to have profit. General, we are concerned when we see American troops on one hand deployed on Polish ground, but kilometers away from a Polish shore, the Russian Navy and Chinese Navy run its own drills during the same time. Is it a part of uh, Chinese and Russian answer to the American activity that was decided by President Trump to deploy the troops here? 
It's our responsibility, it's America's responsibility, along with its allies, to provide deterrence, military deterrence, to prevent military attack by either Russia or China. And I believe that we are committed to doing that. I think in the face of that, with the risks that China would face or Russia would face for a military conflict with the United States, they would much rather try to undermine societies for men. It's far less risk for them, far less danger for their uh, regimes. And the nature of the Russian-Chinese cooperation, in your opinion? I think it's actually symbiotic. The Russians practice atomization. They like to tear societies apart. Chinese practice obfuscation. They like to hide everything they do. So in the, when the Russians are tearing societies apart, China can come in the back door and take everything out. General, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank, thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you.